Welcome to another episode, Dr. James Beckett, Sports Card Insights, here in Chicago, taking advantage of uh, the proximity of many of our sponsors being uh, close by and enjoying what has been, uh, I think, a really outstanding show. I'm here again with uh, Rob Veris, who does not have a table, but his presence is being felt in all four corners of the of the uh, of the show. He's uh, an aggressive buyer. Uh, just because he has 43 million cards. A database doesn't mean he wouldn't like to have another million if there are a million cards that uh, fill in some other gaps. He's very customer-centric. Today's episode is going to be dealing with uh, Burbank sports cards, more so than Rob's personal story, how he has uh, built this um, uh, amazing card shop that's more than a store, but it, it's that, and the online presence is amazing. But we have other sponsors, too. Don't want to shortchange them. Uh, Mike Stadium Sports Cards, uh, again, different kind of car- hobby shop, a great experience there, but uh, he does it his way and does it well. Heritage Auctions and Huggins and Scott Auctions, again, two auction houses that do it very differently, but both very enjoyable and, and uh, both uh, classy outfits. Uh, Panini Tops and Upper Deck. They're here in force, and it's nice to know that uh, uh, all of those car companies are helping, helping, continue to help build the, build the industry. And last and not least, but ComC and uh, Beckett Media, BGS, BAS, uh, and those are kind of database ent- uh, entities. So your store, Rob, is uh, a database. You're you're very very prominent on on Beckett Marketplace. I think you do some on ComC, mm-hmm. but. Uh, well, tell us about Burbank Sports uh, Sports Cards. Your store is this your third location? Yes, yes, it's my third location. Um, our first store um, we bought from the original owner. I'm going to say it was about 1,800 square feet. Um, basically, like I said before, I started working there in '79 and bought the business in '89. Um, in '95, well, I can go back a year before that. We had the Northridge earthquake, uh, January 17th, mm-hmm. and that really changed the tra- trajectory of our business because a store that got hit especially hard across the street from us never reopened. And the building was empty for a little while. And my father, who's a general contractor, decided to buy it. And we moved and we basically had 4,300 square feet. So we had a huge upgraded space. And um, that show, that shop was pretty amazing. Um, I believe that you were there. And it was uh, 38 showcases. It was, to me, it was the ultimate walk-in destination, the organization. And it's true. It was a walk-in database. It was something where if you knew what you needed, we had it physically available for you. Um, You're welcome to go through cards, Pull cards, everything was priced. You know, Beckett went up on Frank Thomas. We whipped out the price gun and we had to sit there and manually well, just change like, the price. Just like to apologize. Yeah. yeah. The, the 4,300 square feet, was that like 1,000 up front and 3,300 in the back? It was or? pretty well split. It was, basically, it was basically 50 50, but the problem became we actually rented three other buildings, two on our block, one that was two blocks away. As we grew, we had things in multiple locations and it was just getting unwieldy. And Even though you had racks, didn't you? You went up pretty high, didn't you? We had racks, but not like we have now. Yeah. And we had racks in other buildings. And when e-commerce came along, we'd be fulfilling an order from four different places and it just wasn't sustainable. And uh, we were in that building until uh, 2007. And we moved to our current location then, which is now 7,500 square feet. So and everything's in there now? Or everything's in one room? place. We have a couple storage containers on the side of the building. But speaking of storage containers, I'll tell you a quick story. Um, the biggest purchase that we ever made, um, there was a gentleman named Larry Ching. And Anybody that has ever sold cards at the National or in general might have run into Larry over the years, an older um, Asian gentleman that basically wanted to collect everything. <laughs> and uh, he was our best customer. He'd come in for three days at a time. And um, we do lunch. We go out for about an hour. But um, basically, he passed away in 2007. And the family called me. And um, it was a bad time for me. My mom passed two days afterwards. Mm-hmm. And so it was like this horrible time. But I really wanted to go to his funeral. Because he was like an uncle to me, and yeah. I wouldn't have the business I have today without him. Yeah, right. Went out there, only person from the industry there. The daughter is talking to me. You need to come out and tell us what to do with all these cards. We have seven storage containers, uh, storage units, and we have half of a four thousand foot house that are just pure cards. Yeah. I went out there about six months later, and I'd never seen anything like it before. I would have traded my existing inventory for his collection. <laughs> it was that insane. So put it number. He bought a lot of stuff from you. He bought a lot of stuff. A lot from of stuff he was a one man economy in this industry, yeah. and I put a number to it. Um, just to give an idea of what it's worth, not knowing that they wanted to sell it or for me to buy it. Yeah. And I get a call about two months later, that number you gave us, are you interested? It was a lot of money. It was money I didn't have. And so I had to sit there and try to make that happen and wrap my head around what I'm talking about. Because not only was it a huge collection, it was on an island 3,000 miles away. How would you even get oh, back? Right. <clears throat> so I did some research, found a moving company. 
had eight men working on it. It was unbelievable amount of stuff. Long story short, it took three 40 foot storage, con- uh, storage containers on a ship to get it all back. And it was known as the Hawaii deal. Things from 96, 99 basketball that I wish I still had. Oh, yeah. Complete sets going back to 33, tobacco, 97 legends auto set. I mean, just the craziest deal I've ever bought. And, you know, it's just years of buying deals like that. And people come in the store, do you buy cards? And what I'll do is, let me give you the nickel tour real quick. I'll take them in the warehouse. I've got 43 million cards in the warehouse, Jim, but I'm not a manufacturer. Yeah. So, yes, I buy cards. But you're known for, I mean, so he was buying a little bit of everything from lots of people. You're mainly, I mean, your bread and butter is helping people finish sets and, and be a player collector, getting things. Sure. Uh, was he doing that too? He was a completist. He didn't start a set unless he planned on finishing oh, okay. it. Yeah. And he loved my store. So he'd eventually get to you. Who knew? But uh, yeah, he'd always come back to me. We were at a show in 98 in Philly, and he, we went and got a, a meal. And he goes, Rob, I want you to buy everything on this floor and bring it back to me so I can actually purchase it. Because nothing's organized at a show. He's got want list oh. like, the LA, like the LA phone book. He's going through, he's looking at a card, he has to go into his book to see if he has it. Oh, I've already got it, puts it back. When he comes to me, I bring everything back from a show. It gets sliced and diced exactly how he wants it. He had access to my showcases, my safe. Yeah. And, you know, wow. I had everything the way he wanted it. And he would pay three times the money to me than he would at a show because he could actually find everything. And he's a case study in the fact that you don't need to be the cheapest. You just have to be, have the best mousetrap. Well, there needs to be, a, there, there's a service provided. And when people want to, want you to go pull a, pull a card to even, you know, the, my, in some sense, be worth a nickel. <laughs> just pulling the card, putting it in. There, there is such thing, not just as shipping, but handling. Sure. There has to be some handling. Now, if they go pull their own cards, that's yeah. different. But when, when you know, I had a card shop 40, 40 years ago. Yeah, 40 years ago. Wow. <laughs> With that soaking for a second. Wow. That's a, anyway, <laughs> that's a big number. People, when you let people pull their own at the end of the week or whatever, you have to go reorganize all the cards and keep a track of the pricing of all this stuff. My, my hat's off to you. You, you well, obviously figured out how to um, how to uh, systematize things in such a way that, again, it could be enjoyable for you and enjoyable for your customers. When when somebody's trying to decide what business they want to get into as, as a career, a good clue is if you really enjoy doing activities that most of the rest of the world regards as drudgery, mm-hmm. then you're probably on the right track. Yeah. And you and I both have been very blessed to have that. So You gave me the best advice I ever got, Jim, and I repeat it constantly, and you've heard it a million times, but do what's difficult and do it better than anybody else. And you, when you started Beckett, you took something that was damn near impossible, yeah. and, in, and you built you know, the systems well, that I ended up... In, you know. I always felt like we, perhaps, maybe this is a stretch, but I always felt that you had partial imitators, and we in our company had partial imitators. In other words, they wanted your success, right. and they thought there were probably three key things that you did, and if they just copied those three things, or three things that we did well that were maybe obvious, but they, uh, but you understand there aren't just three things you had to do well. No. It's a bunch of things, and so they 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 were not able. So uh, do you, uh, there there are other stores out there and other online uh, oh, yes. sellers, but. Um, well, I think it's not just first mover advantage. I think you're you're continuing to, to to stay up on things. Well, we just we don't stay steady where they have a chance to catch us. Yeah. We're doing more per day than anybody else and winding the gap. But one of the things that comes down to also is employees, and we've had great employees over the years. Um, we've enabled them to become great in, in a lot of sense because of our organization. But we've had guys 15, 16 years. They start as 15 and 16 year olds, and they become 30, and they're still with one me. One of the things I was really proud of when we had our company we had some great employees and they generally were there uh, most many of them were there a long time and some of them left and then came back <laughs> that was cool too but uh yeah it's you it's, can't do it by yourself and uh it's you know you have the right systems in place and you know labor isn't cheap it just keeps getting more and more expensive and you know you have to have jobs available that are worth twelve dollars fifteen dollars twenty dollars an hour and, you know, they, you have to have the um, technology in place, the high-speed scanners, access to the Beckett database, relationships with eBay, mm-hmm. the different things that we do that can justify all that work. Well, you need to be uh, knowledgeable and hardworking, and, and you really need a lot of integrity in this industry because there's That's too it. many opportunities for things to, to, to go sideways. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's, you know, with the employees, it's, you know, I used to do everything, and I've learned as I got older, i got to delegate this, I have to delegate that, and... Uh, you know, I'm, I've been blessed. My father was with me for close to 24 yeah. years, yeah. 
And we didn't step on each other's toes. He ran the business side of things, the taxes, the payroll, going to Smart and Final for the supplies. I got to do what I did best, and I was very blessed that I was able to have someone I could trust that took you know, a lot okay. of pressure off me. There, there are a lot more local card shops this year than there were a couple of years ago, I think. Yeah, it's I think exciting. it's been a trending up. And there, you know, we have Mike Fruitman, uh, our other sponsor that's mm-hmm. a card shop, has, a, has an approach. Don't know that he's completely in the Alan Nars camp of, of uh, an enthusiastic experience when you go there, but I think he tries to make it fun. But I've just been thinking about this, and I was just thinking, if you're an extreme extrovert, you probably like that. Yeah. But if you're a friendly introvert like I am, I mean, no offense, Mike, but I think I'd be more comfortable in Rob's store because I could get... get uh, you know, be, really appreciate the organization and see the stuff. So yeah, you know, I'm funny. not yeah. looking for a birthday party. <laughs> I'm looking to to see some cards. But I, I wonder if it breaks down that way. But yeah, it totally does. Word. It's because people, you know, it's 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 a hobby that's so it's it's one of the hobbies that you can enjoy by yourself or with your dad or your son or or friends. Yeah, but it, it can be solitary as well as a group activity, and it can be great either way. Well, Mike's wonderful, and Alan Ars is a perfect example. I used to do seven I saw him today. I saw he's, him today. He's a gonna, riot. I'm going to give him a chance for equal time. Nice. <laughs> but we used to do seminars together, and uh, the thing was, we always said we could have card shops right next to each other, and we wouldn't compete because we're just so different in how we approach the business. And Mike is like right in the middle right. of the two of us. Uh, just a, well, he, he says he went to the one of those top seminars that uh, top sponsored, and the first day you were there, and he's like taking all these notes, and oh, man, this is going to be so great, and I can't wait to get back and reorganize all my stuff and and then the next day Alan Nars came up and he said wait a minute <laughs> there's there's another approach and I think that suited him I think each needs to have their own I think the, the card shops that uh, that uh, that have done well and endured had had uh, uh, a positive customer experience, yeah. and you're epitomizing that on the database side. And I, I think Mike and Alan, those guys, as well. But if you 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 you've got to have something that makes people want to come back. Yeah, one bad and one. You're one always thing. looking for more cards to right. fill in gaps, so that when somebody comes in, they're not going to walk out a, dis, a disappointed customer. You know, your inventory has to remain fresh, and it's uh, as simple as that. Well, we're out of time, Rob. Uh, we could go on a long time. I really, I, I think I just want to put on the record that I'm overdue for getting out to Burbank to see your new store. I haven't been since the last one, and that's embarrassing to say because it is one of the amazing places. And, uh, you know, I, I actually might even get some cards there. Nice. I still collect a little bit of stuff here and there uh, when people come over and I have a little bit of a card room. And, not necessarily my best stuff. I keep my be- Diane. My wife wants me to reemphasize that my very best stuff is kept in a bank vault. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, some of the stuff that people like to look at that's not as expensive is is in my card room, and that'll be fun. So I'm looking forward to getting out there. Keep up the good work. Uh, appreciate you as a friend and as a as a visionary in our industry. And we'll talk again. Thanks, Thanks Tim, for having me. You bet. The man in the house of cards is too-